Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, the Baltimore County Fire Department EMS training series. Uh, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Berenholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU doctor at Hopkins. I'm an active member at the Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, and I have the honor of serving as one of the medical directors in Dr. Pollock's office in Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Pollock and the EMS office, and the EMS office, Director Shenning, Captain Willits, Captain Stewart, Captain Nats, thank you for what you guys do every day. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. A big shout out to Ashley uh, Brooks, who is helping us man the online platform. Ashley, thank you. Uh, importantly for Ashley, you uh, in the chat, if you can monitor the chat function at some point during this talk, she will be posting a link. That link is something that you can click on or cut and paste, and that is where you can find the attendance sheet for you to be able to get your CEUs. So if you want your CEUs, keep an eye out on the chat function. We'll also announce when that's posted, uh, and then you'll be able to use that link to take two seconds to fill out your name and your MIMS number. Uh, we do ask if you could please look now for your MIMS number. Uh, it makes it very difficult to enter you into the MIMS system and give you credit if we don't have your accurate MIMS number. So please try to pay attention to that. Um, so tonight we have Dr. Alistair uh, Kent. Dr. Kent is a trauma surgeon at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. Dr. Kent's areas of clinical expertise include general surgery, trauma and acute care surgery, surgical critical care, and surgical care of medically fragile patients. Dr. Kent is an accomplished educator and researcher Dr. Kent's research interests include studies of healthcare delivery systems, healthcare economics, geographic analysis, trauma care, and systems of care for patients with life-threatening or time-sensitive illnesses. Dr. Kent, thank you. I know you're on service. I know you're very busy. Thank you for your dedication to this work and for educating the EMS providers. Thank you so much. Well, thanks. I appreciate you all having me out. Um, appreciate the introduction. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alistair. I'm one of the trauma surgeons in the Johns Hopkins system. Uh, I work both at Bayview and at the main uh, hospital downtown. Um, I'll be talking about chest and abdominal injuries today. I'll keep it relatively informal. Again, if you have some questions, throw them in the chat and uh, we'll uh, insert them as uh, opportunities arise. Um, let me get your sharing there. Looks great. So everybody see it okay? Good. All right, so this is, you know, you may have seen this clip before. I think I put it in one of the other lectures here where, you know, there, there's settings of, or roles of care that we talk about depending on, you know, which side of the military you're looking at. Um, basically, it's like there's an injury, there's something that happens before the injury, there's something that happens uh, you know, in terms of the transport, and there's something that happens once you get to the hospital, and then even distal to that, there's something that happens once uh, the triage is done and when we're like moving towards definitive care. And I wanted to sort of contextualize chest and abdominal injuries uh, in the way that we often look at the the distal side of it, the, the, that definitive care, uh, with relevance to how do you think about it on the front end and sort of demonstrate this as a, an entire system. So uh, a couple of high yield conditions we'll cover and in the way that we're gonna contextualize this, that will be primarily things like hemorrhage, pneumothorax, um, tamponade, um, and uh, we'll get through why those are the cases and then show some more uh, developed content about you know, what is it that we do with those uncompressible hemorrhages or, or difficult to diagnose uh, organ injuries and that kind of thing. Um, the uh, other thing to keep in, in mind with this is there are a lot of bad things that can happen in, in the setting of injury. Uh, some of these can kill you very quickly and some of them can be very bad and, and cause long-term problems or require a lot of uh, resources and expertise to repair, but not necessarily be as time sensitive um, in terms of not going to kill you in the next few minutes. And, and some of these are, are sometimes the more graphic or, um, uh, you know, gut-wrenching, exciting kind of injuries that we, we think of. And that can be things like, you know, exposed bowel or, or partially amputated limbs and, and that kind of thing. And I think the thing to keep in mind is 
focus on those fast uh, threatening conditions first or, or consider that those also might be going on, you know, behind the scenes of these more, uh, you know, attention grabbing ones. The last concept I want to bring into this is the role of time sensitivity and physiologic reserve. Um, the uh, thing we often run up against in terms of people that do make it to the hospital who then subsequently uh, don't make it out is that the degree of injury is greater that, or requires more time and uh, let's say resources to repair than the patient can physiologically tolerate. And usually that means uh, profound shock uh, with ongoing bleeding uh, that results in things like the blood not clotting anymore, the patient becoming cold, the, the system shutting down, the heart not being able to recover. Uh, the younger you are, the healthier you are to begin with, the, the more of this, you know, quote unquote reserve that you have. Um, but even, you know, a very healthy 18 year old uh, can have, uh, has a limit and, and usually that, that tops out at about a couple of hours after the time of a severe injury. So keep that, that time limit in your head, keep in, as we kind of go through this stuff. Um, and the, especially the, the bounds of it is like, it's not just when you get to the hospital, it's not just or in terms of when it starts or it stops, it starts when the patient's injured and it stops once the definitive control of the injury is achieved. So again, trauma receiving bay, this is the one at Bayview. Um, the, the way that flow works once they get to the hospital, which I'm sure uh, uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, there's the emergency department context, which is the trauma bay, uh, where they often will go either to the operating or intensive care unit for definitive care. And this is really that, uh, uh, end point of when we're thinking about um, uh, control or that that end of the two hour time frame or one hour time frame, depending on how uh, your uh, initial physiologic reserve is, um, and then once they're stabilized, then you know either going to typically the intensive care unit for a very severely injured person or you know even hospital rooms. And there's many variations to this as to how the flow works. Some people require multiple operating room trips or or returns to the intensive care unit. Um, or even just observation in a, a, a normal hospital room that, or with uh, simple telemetry, for example, in the case of a cardiac contusion. Um, and then obviously there's the coming back to the hospital after the fact that uh, is the uh, uh, case in, in many uh, patients. So we talk about the those things again that are going to kill you in the next minute and often our, our primary survey or you know the first assessment we do when they get to, get to the trauma bay is designed around this and so you know airway breathing circulation the, the abcs that we all hear are designed to really rapidly assess for those uh particular problems um you know is the airway okay is there attention in the thorax is there like shock present or not is there something actively bleeding or not and, and you know major neurological problems and then the look all over and see is there some major obvious problem that needs to be addressed um th this is a, just a rough sketch of how we think about timing once the, the patient arrives to the uh trauma receiving bay again we're looking for handoffs between uh, ems and the trauma team of about 30 seconds uh, up to a minute for somebody that's uh, maybe a little bit more stable with a complex story. Uh, but, you know, things like, you know, stable or not during transport, what kind of interventions have been done, um, you know, what are, what are the obvious injuries uh, or the things that, again, you guys have a lot of experience with and um, are aware of. Uh, but then the next approximately 15 to 20 minutes are, are the figuring out, you know, what's wrong and then putting it in a priority order of how to address it. Um, often, you know, the, we try to shoot for an hour uh, after uh, injury as an optimal time to establish that, uh, you know, hemostasis or that uh, control of injury. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean having everything finished in the operating room, but like getting to the point where the blood's no longer leaking out in a significant way. Um, and, you know, we even talk about the, not just the golden hour, but that platinum 10 minutes, which is about the amount of time in extremis a healthy person can tolerate um, before, um, you know, sort of falling off the physiologic curve. And that becomes very important for things like massive hemorrhage and, you know, how much time do you have to, to really control that and relates to how much uh, 
success you have in in terms of treating those you know multiple gunshot wound uh, severe uh, hemorrhage kind of patients that come in uh, that we see uh, quite a lot uh, our operative strategy is again it, it centers around preserving physiology it, it's minimized that time in decompensated states where the body is you know in that fight or flight you're you know adrenaline is up high you're you're really burning all your reserve in order to keep the, the brain and the heart alive um, at the expense of literally everything else uh, in, in all the cells in your body. So, the, you know, you get acidosis, everything becomes ischemic. Once you even once you fix that, you have reperfusion injuries that can happen, um, particularly to things like the bowel, uh, the extremities. And, uh, you know, the things that we do to get them through those times of extremists, including epinephrine, uh, large resuscitations, fluid uh, can actually hurt you on the back end, especially, you know, uh, about an hour in once you've stopped the bleeding. If there's, you know, too much strain on the heart from over, over resuscitation, over transfusion, this can be a big problem that, that doesn't have a good solution. Uh, so we think about priorities in terms of one, stop the bleeding. I mean, it's, it's once you've got the, the airway and, and breathing controlled, which usually should happen within a few minutes, the bleeding becomes the you know, overall determinant of whether the patient makes it out or not. Um, there's many ways that we can do this. Again, there's there things that you can do before the operating room uh, that we call compressible uh, or, or hemorrhage that's compressible and then things that require operative intervention, which follows the same principles just through cuts in the skin and the tissue. Um, we identify the injury pattern, we control the contamination, um, and then we got to either put everything back together or have a damage control uh, strategy in terms of exiting the operating room. Again, trying to preserve that physiology. And this is what we call the, that uh, spiral of death uh, that happens once when somebody is in physiologic extremis, they become cold, their blood stops clotting, they become acidotic, um, and, which uh, all feeds on each other and um, can lead to unrecoverable situations. And so you try to stop this before that happens. And that all, all plays back into how important time is. And, it, and again, just to re-emphasize, re which I'll continue to do through the lecture, uh, you know, you, your best currency to avoid this situation is maintaining that uh, uh, rapid control of the initial problem from the time of injury, uh, rather than uh, from other uh, more arbitrary indicators of when uh, you're measuring. So just uh, again, a brief list of the survivable things that can kill you in a few minutes. So there's non-survivable things like, you know, decapitation and, you know, heart uh, blowouts that, uh, you know, are nearly instantaneous. Uh, but assuming you've survived the initial insult, uh, massive hemorrhage obviously is something that can kill you very quickly. And that's, you know, major artery bleeding. Uh, not so much like an aortic injury, but like a subclavian or a axillary artery injury, uh, femoral artery, um, large organs like the liver or the spleen, the lung, if it's uh, in the right place. Uh, these kind of things are, are often divided up into whether you can put pressure on it before you get to the hospital or not. Uh, and, and if you can, we call that compressible hemorrhage. Again, you guys see this a lot. Um, if you can put a tourniquet on it, great. Um, if you can, you can't put a tourniquet on it and you can hold, you know, hands on it uh, to stop the, the flow there, you know, great. If you can't do that, such as on the chest or the abdomen, then, you know, that's a, a larger problem. And again, that amount of time that it takes between the initial injury and when they actually are in a more uh, stabilized state, uh, you know, for surgery or having an angioembolization or something like that can um, really make the difference. So tension pneumothorax is another one then that we'll spend some time on here a little bit later. Um, the uh, similar condition, cardiac tamponade, um, has uh, similar effects but slightly different causes. Again, we'll spend a little bit of uh, time demonstrating uh, the, the effects of that. Um, and then the non-chest things that are somewhat related, airway obstruction, um, you know, obviously the faster you clear the airway and intubate the surgical intervention being a uh, cardiothyroidotomy. Um, and then, you know, obviously some uh, different modalities that we have in the hospital. The key is being, you know, what is that um, determinant of how fast are they failing? Is it, you know, you want to try to intervene early 
in terms of intubation and that kind of thing. Um, massive CNS trauma, of, you know, herniation in particular, if you've got signs of this, there's uh, interventions that you can do uh, with, that, with just IV access. And then the critical hospital intervention would be surgical decompression. Um, and then chest arrhythmias. In, in the trauma setting, these are relatively uncommon um, in isolation. I think the, one of the big reasons you might see it is either because they've had a cardiac injury uh, from a blunt trauma and have some arrhythmias, excuse me, arrhythmias after that. Um, but these are typically uh, benign. They're usually self-limited. Uh, the severe ones you, can be treated with ACLS protocols like any uh, other arrhythmia, uh, but uh, typically, the, the, or I should say more commonly, what we see uh, in the setting of uh, you know, cardiac trauma, cardiac injury, is arrhythmias due to the physio physiologic decompensation from severe bleeding. Um, and so fixing the initial bleeding is the uh, primary goal. Uh, again, thinking about chest and abdomen, these are the three that you really want to focus on. Um, and you'll, you'll notice that if you look at the field interventions, the volume loading almost always helps. Um, in terms of tension pneumothorax and cardiac tamponade, volume loading will build up pressure on the venous side of the heart um, that uh, makes a patient more resilient to that pressure increase uh, and give them a larger window before it causes cardiovascular collapse, um, even without definitive management, which again, for things like tamponade can be quite difficult um, in the pre-hospital setting. Um, notably, there are things that are not on this uh, uh, minutes or, or, you know, can kill you very quick list. And, and obviously, some of these things are, are bad. Um, you know, the, we mentioned aortic transection before. Often the problem is if it's a really severe transection, it's almost an instantaneous uh, lethal problem. Uh, but if it is not an instantaneous lethal problem, then it's been contained by the surrounding tissues and actually becomes much lower priority compared to something like a massive liver injury. Um, the uh, common thing in this list in terms of, again, like guts that are hanging out, deformities of the extremities, uh, big open chest wounds, uh, that kind of thing, is that the associated injuries with these are often the more lethal problem, uh, not necessarily the, the, the showy obvious injury. So what I tell the, the residents and the uh, uh, trauma team in the hospital is probably true in the pre-hospital setting as well. Uh, you know, your intervention will fail, you know, if you do it enough times. The, most of these things are, are not, you know, what we might think of as a high reliability uh, intervention. The, the effectiveness is in the like 60, 80 percent range, um, if that. And so always have a contingency plans. Uh, in your head and you know if this fails what's the next uh, best option uh, and, and in the transport setting you know that might just be making sure that that uh, time management is appropriately used um, reducing opportunities for error simplifying decisions choices requests um, also prevents you from uh, getting in these uh, time sucks that uh, uh, eventually lead to problems down the road or you know down the line in terms of that one to two hour uh, definitive uh, care window so getting to the actual parts that we were planning to talk about the chest um hemorrhage is really the it, one half of what we're going to talk about here and what you know how do you temporize how do you stop it in, in terms of the hospital management and i'll give you a kind of overview of that and then in, in terms of Key pre-hospital interventions. It, this is the same thing. It, it's, is it compressible or not? If it's you know subclavian or you know axillary injury that doesn't really fit a tourniquet well, those things often can be compressed. Um, but if it's you know something more central in the chest, then you know obviously that's a little more difficult. Um, rapid transport, volume loading, as as we kind of discussed, can be helpful. Um, and then. In the terms of pneumothorax, we'll spend some time talking about tension and uh, needle decompression, uh, as well as sort of the special case of sucking chest wounds. Uh, the thing about chest injuries, uh, you know, it's common for penetrating trauma. The uh, majority of the time, these don't need the actual surgery, that, but they may need something like a, a, a thoracostomy or chest tube procedure uh, to drain the 
blood or the pneumothorax or uh, whatever it is, uh, about 20% of them will need, um, you know, a operation at some point during their uh, hospitalization, like in the potentially in the first 24 hours to the first week, depending on there's whether they continue to bleed into the chest or not after an injury. Um, and then a very small percent uh, actually need uh, immediate thoracotomy. And then that's sort of people that are losing their vital signs as they roll into the trauma bay um, or, you know, massive amounts of blood coming out of the chest when the chest tube goes in. Uh, again, we talked about things that can kill you fast. So obstruction of the airway um, is why it's A in the ABCs. Um, tension pneumothorax, which, uh, you know, builds up pressure on the inside of the chest and then overcomes the, the venous flow. Again, we'll, we'll go over that in the tamponade. And then major vascular injuries. Um, the uh, major vascular injury inside the chest uh, often... Uh, if this is a peri arrest kind of situation, this is the times when we're going to actually open the chest at the bedside in the trauma bay um, in order to at least get some temporary control. And this is essentially the trauma surgery version of holding pressure on it. Um, and then we, we do that to tr then stabilize enough to transport to the operating room where we can do some more, you know, definitive technical repair. Um, big, uh, Bronchial injuries that cause, uh, you know, the skin to puff up and be kind of rest crispy, screpitous. Um, most bleeding in the chest, a small cardiac injury that's slowly bleeding uh, is bad, but somewhat less time sensitive than the things in the, the list that we've uh, looked at just a little bit ago. Um, and so again, definitely time sensitive, definitely severe, but um, in terms of priorities can be delayed somewhat uh, compared to the other things. So this is a I think, belief in the Gray's Anatomy book that's been colorized. Again, it's supposed to look like this. That's nice. Um, Ken Maddox, who is a uh, famous trauma surgeon who is now uh, uh, sort of later in his career, um, wrote a book called Top Knife. Uh, and this was one of the quotes that he put in it. Uh, and it's about, it's a book about trauma surgery, but the, the point is that the, the body on the inside looks a little bit different than on the outside. This is a fairly optimistic, uh, uh, view from a cadaver dissection, um, which shows fairly typical anatomy. Uh, and this is the, what you can see there at the bottom of the screen is the aortic arch, um, which you can see down here. Uh, and then, you know, the, the anominate and the carotid coming off, uh, at the top with a, you know two of the three vessels and the subclavian and then this is just one of the large veins that comes across the middle uh importantly in real life there's several variations of that anatomy and you can see that's anything from everything coming off in one ma major vessel uh here or splitting in different ways and so having some some of that awareness that these things can be the case uh, more so than even just memorizing every variation is uh, important to stay safe when you're diving into this uh, areas of the body where there's a lot of important structures. Uh, one example, so subclavian, which is, again, looking at this, you can see the aortic arch coming up. Uh, on the left side, the subclavian typically comes off that side of the chest and there, you know, an injury up there next to where it comes off the thoracic outlet at the rib cage can be, you know, a fairly challenging thing to deal with. Um, there's a couple of ways you can get at this. And one is going through, as you can see on the left side here, a small hole in the left side of the chest and putting a clamp on it. Um, again, very optimistic picture compared to real life. Um, or you can go just below the collarbone um, as shown on, on the right picture. And just to give you a little better idea of uh, what that looks like, um, in real life, so this is a, a picture of a Rommel tourniquet. This is basically just some uh, cloth tape that's uh, been wrapped around and then put inside of a drain and then you put a clamp on the back side of the, this uh, little piece here. Um, and, and that just cinches down around the, the vessel to, again, basically just holds pressure on it. But um, you can see you can actually get at the aorta from the inside of the chest and uh, get what we call proximal control uh, in order to do that. Uh, and similarly, they've uh, demonstrated some of the other structures, the, the vagus nerve, the 
uh, arch of the aorta coming down. This is the, the pericardium in the heart here, and then the phrenic nerve uh, that controls the diaphragm running along the surface of the heart there, which we try not to cut if we can uh, help it. Usually you can see it pretty well. Uh, again, going below the, the clavicle is not the other way we can get to it. You have to, or going above the clavicle rather in this view, um, you do have to divide the uh, scalene muscle without cutting the phrenic nerve, which you can see illustrated there. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to get control of this, um, at least in the, uh, the trauma-based setting where you, know, you need to do this within a minute or two. Uh, and then you can go to the operating room and spend 30 minutes or an hour actually preparing the injury. Um, getting to the, the actual heart stuff, um, tamponade is a phenomenon which it happens both because of pressure accumulation within the pericardium, uh, within the sac itself, or within the, the, the entire chest in the case of something like tension pneumothorax. Um, there's a lot of variations of this, but the, the two main ones are cardiac tamponade and tension uh, pneumo. Uh, and there's all some mixed uh, versions. Uh, essentially, the problem is that the fluid that accumulates in that uh, pericardial sac and trauma, typically from a penetrating injury, like a stab wound to the right ventricle or to the left, um, oh, starts leaking blood into the sac, which is a, a very, it's a very fibrous, tough sac. It doesn't expand or blow up at all. Um, and that pressure starts building up uh, to the point it starts squeezing the heart. Um, in particular, you know, a, a left-sided injury uh, comes from that high pressure side of the heart, which, you know, the pressures are in normal blood pressure, right? 120 millimeters of mercury. Um, even a hypotensive patient, 60 to 90 millimeters of mercury. But, but the, the right side of the heart's uh, pressure is somewhere more like zero to four, excuse me, on the, uh, on the filling side. And so, you know, even low pressure left-sided uh, uh, bleeding can eventually build up enough to occlude the, pr the flow on the right side of the heart, which then stops all flow and deprimes the pump, so to speak, uh, making it uh, hard for you to do the other things like be alive. So the way you treat it is, you know, you relieve the pressure. You either put a drain in it, um, fix the wounds, or, uh, you know, open it up and uh, let it uh, expand, which again sounds simple, but uh, in real life it, it looks a little more complicated. Um, this is one of the reasons that we we do an ED thoracotomy or resuscitated thoracotomy once they get to the hospital is uh, for acute tamponade resulting in cardiac arrest, and this is probably the scenario in which it's the most effective at actually uh, controlling it and being survivable. Um, doesn't work so well for things like blunt trauma. Um, this is because the injuries tend to be more diffuse uh, and, and uh, less uh, immediately recoverable. But you know, when there is a, something that can be a, a quick uh, fix in the case of this, we just open the pericardium um, and pull the heart out. And it, it uh, you know, if it's a small wound, oftentimes we can just fix it. In this case, what you're seeing is they've got a, you know, urinary Foley catheters put into the holes uh, with the balloons up that uh, are occluding the wound. Um, you'll see that they're not doing it quite right here because there's blood coming out the backside of uh, one of the catheters. Typically, you put a clamp on this. Um, they also put the retractor on upside down, but you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, what we actually do to fix it, I mean, there's some techniques that you can see here to get around things like coronary vessels, which you don't just wanna throw a bunch of stitches in uh, because again, the heart likes to have those to, to beat. Um, you know, like putting a stitch around that is equivalent to having a heart attack um, from a acute blockage. Uh, you can see the atrium can be fixed with a, a clamp uh, as demonstrated here on the right side. Uh, that actually comes together pretty well. It's, it's not uh, uh, particularly difficult to repair uh, unless the injury is large. Um, and then the ventricle injury, sometimes you have to do a little more careful uh, sewing and tying in order to get it. And again, keep in mind that the heart wiggles and beats between um, your uh, repair efforts uh, in the best of cases. If it's not doing that, then um, you have to sew really fast. So moving to things behind all the heart in the aorta, the trachea uh, can also be injured. Stab wounds or uh, gunshots are probably the most common. Uh, very uncommon to actually have a, a tracheal injury in the setting of blunt, blunt trauma. Um, it's flexible. It doesn't really tear super easily. Um, 
it, you know, even in things like where the aorta has had a, a you know, quote unquote transection or a, a partial uh, injury due to a uh, high deceleration uh, or high energy deceleration, uh, the trachea usually is okay. Um, the uh, oftentimes they will present with a very uh, endothorax, but then a very large uh, amount of air leaking out either into the skin and puffing them up like uh, Rice Krispies, or um, you know if you have a needle in uh, to decompress the chest or a chest tube, uh, there's a large amount of air blowing out. It's difficult to really diagnose this in the field um, unless you know there's a large hole in the chest and, and there's just air coming out as you're um, ventilating through it. Uh, you might notice that if you've got the patient intubated that your ventilator's volumes are, are not returning um, and it's giving you alarms like that usually because the air is being lost through this large uh, defect. Um, we have a lot of approaches to deal with these. It depends really on where the level of the injury is. Um, oftentimes pushing the intracheal tube past the injury is a temporizing measure that we will use, but you have to be careful because the the carina, the, you know, the bottom of the, the trachea where the, the bronchus splits is fragile and can be inadvertently uh, injured or very ruptured uh, if things are pushed down too aggressively. And, and, you know, we've had a couple of traumas where that has been the case. Um, but uh, there are a lot of options for, for managing this. Like the keys in the, the pre-hospital setting is, is just normal ventilation, which often will be, buy you enough time to, to get into a more definitive uh, setting where, you know, even things such as uh, ECMO can be considered, which is like a, a heart-lung bypass type machine. Uh, it's just an example of a CAT scan that shows uh, an injury. And you can see that the, the dark air is here or where things are ready to loosen, the, you know, the air x-rays pass through easily. Um, and it's re representative of air tracking around things like the great vessels, like, you know, carotid and jugular. This is the trachea itself. These are the lungs. This is the spine. Um, and then you can see the, the actual defect there. Um, if you look at it with a, a camera, like a flexible endoscope, uh, th this particular case is actually one where we had a, a very difficult airway. Um, and after multiple attempts, I there was a, a endotracheal tube probably with a stylet on it that was advanced uh, too deeply into the uh, the airway and that hard metal actually ripped through the the carina or the, the first part of the bronchus um, which ended up being difficult to repair and so what you're looking at here is um, on this right side this this goes into um, the bronchus but then looking over here uh, to the left then you have uh, just uh, mediastinum um, in that space in the chest outside the airways this is actually the same patient um, and you can see we've put a endotracheal tube into the hole uh, in the carina. And this is a little difficult view to appreciate, but essentially this is a little retractor pushing the lung down. This is the base of that uh, area where the injury is. Um, and this is just pulling the esophagus out of the way. Uh, this, so you can see it's the spine uh, sitting uh, just behind there. Um, this is... Uh, and again, medical illustrator optimistic view of how that looks um, and showing some ways that you can still actually uh, ventilate the patient and manage this. So people can tolerate a single lung most of the time uh, if you know you don't have severe COPD or something like that. Um, as it, it collapses, then it, it cuts its own blood flow off and that way you, know, you don't get a bad pulmonary shunt. Um, this is one way that you can preserve it again that you can see that they're intentionally driving this endotracheal tube down into the the opposite side here uh, looking like the left um, and allowing for repair of the bronchus again this this all takes time like getting into this part of the body is probably a you know 30 minutes of actually moving the patient and positioning them um, and another 30 of cutting through the parts of the rib cage and putting the spreaders in and moving the esophagus out of the way and moving the lung out of the way to uh, get to all that. And so again, it, it all sort of relates back to that. How long do you have before of somebody being relatively hypoxic, of, you know, likely still bleeding and uh, that sort of thing before you have, uh, you know, complete uh, loss of their physiologic reserve. The, um, 
the lung, you know, obviously can be injured. This is demonstrating, excuse me, demonstrating a technique called the Hyler twist, um, where the image you see is uh, on the top in schematic, it, just a, a emergency thoracotomy like we did, we saw with the, the balloon occlusion before. Um, but in this case, the lung ble would be bleeding. Uh, and what you do is you, you take the lung and you spin it um, about 180 degrees. Um, and that twist off the, the blood flow uh, or the, the vessels leading to the lung and so can really slow down the blood flow, at least temporarily. Uh, you can also put your hand around it. Um, you know, it's about the size of a large garden hose um, and you can compress fairly easily. You have to be gentle because those vessels are fragile, but they're flexible enough that you can gently hold them or put a, a small clamp on. Um, if you put it too tight, you get the, the tension effect or the tamponade effect, which uh, sometimes we see if we're packing the chest um, and then closing it. Uh, occasionally we do have to actually unpack to allow the blood flow to continue at its normal pressure um, and allow the heart to actually fill and push blood forward. Um, the uh, way you actually manage the lung injury depends on how bad it is. Sometimes we actually have to divide a part of the lung um, with staplers and uh, sutures and that kind of thing to uh, get to the inside bleeding vessel and then sew that, um, what we call a tractotomy. Um, moving kind of from lung injury, thinking about tension pneumothorax. Now, this is a, one of the three significant types of pneumothorax and that uh, as air escapes an injured lung, it builds up pressure inside the chest wall, um, which sometimes can happen after the setting of you've, you've intubated a patient, for example, with multiple rib fractures um, for you know, hypoxia, pulmonary contusion, or poor GCS score from a bad head injury uh, that happened at the same time. But because the ventilator uses positive pressure, you know, it blows air in uh, rather than the chest sucking air in. Uh, by expanding, then that pressure can actually communicate to outside the lung through the, the injured section. And as that builds up, you can have uh, development of tension um, within, you know, a period of minutes uh, or, you know, even somewhat later than that. Uh, again, the, the normal blood pressure of the venous side of the circulation is about four millimeters of mercury. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of pressure buildup in somebody, especially who's hypovolemic, who's been bleeding, injured, et cetera, to get to that point at, of which they have, well, you know, cardiovascular collapse or arresting of blood flow uh, due to loss of fiddling. The um, veins themselves are, they're very stretchy. They're very flimsy. The, the design is they hold a lot of the capacitance or the extra um, volume of blood. Uh, but conversely, there, there's not a lot of rigid support that allows uh, them to be resistant to pressure from the outside. So they're very easy to occlude by just pressing down. Um, the uh, symptoms typically are not present until they begin, and then it's a very rapid onset from tachycardia, hypotension to very severe hypotension or, or even cardiac arrest. Um, the good side of this is it's also fairly rapidly recoverable. Um, the, uh, once the tension is uh, released, uh, if sometimes there's a short period of cardiac resuscitation required, CPR, drugs, but oftentimes uh, it spontaneously recovers uh, if the intervention is done in time. Uh, and it can be very impressive if you've never seen it happen. Like, you know, you, you take a needle and you put it in and there's this little rush of air and then all of a sudden that pressure of 50 over palp comes up to, you know, 120. Um, it, and it's you know, something that, that you can apply very effectively in, in the right circumstances. Uh, the, the critical piece is really the tension pneumothorax is, it can be a very difficult diagnosis to make, and especially in a noisy field, noisy ambulance, noisy trauma bay, noisy operating room, the, the settings where people actually develop these from trauma are often not conducive to classical diagnosis. You're never gonna see distended neck veins. You're maybe sometimes gonna hear breath sounds um, but, uh, most common, like what we see is just, you know, chest injury with sudden onset of hypotension, tachycardia, um, <laughs> um, thanks. 
So the um, with those uh, onsetting symptoms, sometimes the other feature that can stand out as a patient who does not want to lay back or sit down, they feel very anxious, they want to lean forward, um, uh, having this like impending sense of doom, the, those are the kinds of things that uh, should be red flags for, you know, there might be some uh, tension problem going on in the chest. Uh, this is what it looks like on an x-ray. Again, not going to be something you see in the field, but oftentimes we get these uh, on arrival to the trauma bay. Uh, and it really is here to demonstrate the the amount of pressure that can build up. You can see on the uh, the right side of the chest. Again, remember this is mirrored because it's looking on the face. Uh, right side of the chest, the lung is here. Left side of the chest, there's a, a collapsed lung border that you can see, and then uh, a large space of just air um, sitting outside the chest. Uh, you can see there's some broken ribs that probably were the cause of this. Uh, some air tracking outside of the chest wall into the, the skin, the sub tissue. Uh, but most significantly, you see that the, the mediastinum, that see the trachea here, the aorta here, the heart are all shifted over to the right side uh, significantly due to that pressure. Um, and that's the, that's the scenario where you're going to start to see issues with uh, blood flow return um, and is a very high risk. You, you really shouldn't be seeing this on... Uh, on an x-ray without an intervention having already been done. Hey, Alistair. Yeah. So there's a question, can you speak to the risks versus benefits of field decompression yes. for suspected tension pneumothorax? Yes. Um, that's actually a good segue into our next little thing. So tension pneumothorax is, is a, as we discussed, it's a pressure problem that due to air building up in the chest that can be relieved by putting a needle into that. Um, the goal of this is really to buy time. It's not a definitive therapy. It, uh, you know, can convert a tension pneumothorax to an open pneumothorax where there's communication between the inside and the outside of the chest. Um, it's not uncommon at all for needle decompression to injure the lung tissue. Um, but, the most commonly, if, if the needle is placed correctly, that injury to the lung, even if they don't have a pneumothorax, um, results in a, a much more benign condition than a missed tension pneumothorax. Um, you know, the, whenever you get a needle decompression, you automatically buy yourself a chest tube once you get to the hospital, uh, which, you know, will stay in for usually about three days uh, while the lung heals and uh, seals up the leak. But uh, very rarely there's need for a surgical repair after that, but it, it's very uncommon. Um, if you put the needle in and you get a rush of air, that sort of is your diagnosis that shows that what you did worked. You release pressure and then you should see improvement in the uh, vital signs. Uh, importantly, this does not work for blood in the chest. The, the needles are too small uh, for any effective flow to come out. Um, and so one of the, the reasons that it, it can fail is if there's a hemoneumothorax with a large amount of blood and then the clot stops up the, the flow. Um, the uh, places that you actually want to put it, I actually really like this picture, even though obviously I didn't take it, um, are either in that second intercostal space on the mid anterior uh, midclavicular line or uh, high on the chest laterally, like fifth, fourth, fifth intercostal space. Uh, the most common problem that we see with these is they're actually, you know, since we've shifted from the anterior clavicular approach to the, the anterior axillary approach, um, is that they're placed too low. Um, and I did want to spend a little time showing why that, that's an issue. And again, this gets to the risk of field decompression. Um, the abdomen goes up a lot higher than you would think. It, it, you know, when the person is uh, completely in expiration, has exhaled all their air, the, the diaphragm lifts up to about the level of the nipple line on both sides. Um, and you know, that extends both front, back, um, and into the sides. So if you think about what's on the other side of the diaphragm, uh, looking at this uh, uh, schematic here, you know, the liver is on the right side, the spleen's on the left, there's colon and stomach that sometimes sneak over there um, that can be injured by, you know, a large bore needle being uh, put through the chest. And so I'll, this is a, a risk with, chest tube placement as well is that, you know, poking through the chest, the diaphragm is a very thin sheet of muscle. You can, can poke through it without very much effort at all. 
um, even with a blunt clamp uh, or your finger if you're pushing hard enough and actually injure those uh, organs. Um, thinking about like why we put them in the, se the second intercostal space or the fifth, um, you can kind of see a little better with this diagram. Uh, of note, they've taken out the first rib here um, and their rib spacing is not entirely accurate, but it still I think communicates the, the major point. If you look at the sites on those uh, second intercostal space, the anterior or approach or the midclavicular lines, um, there's really nothing in the chest besides lung tissue there. Uh, there's no major vessels, there's no heart, there's no liver, uh, there's no nerves. Uh, the, the key is just to stay on top of the rib as the needle goes in, as the, the blood vessels for the ribs actually run on the bottom side. So you want to stay away from that because they do bleed quite a lot. Um, but poking straight in, you know, even if you overshoot or go too deep, the most you're going to really do is cause a, a fairly modest lung injury. Um, again, it's not nothing. It does, you know, it, it can keep somebody in the hospital for a few days. It causes them to need a chest tube chest tubes don't feel very good. Um, so I wouldn't recommend just doing this empirically to everybody that's had a chest injury, but if there's any significant concern for tension physiology, especially if there's like vital signs changes, um, you can't hear breath sounds on one side, uh, that kind of thing, then you know decompressing empirically might you know, save you a lot of uh, uh, problems going forward. Same thing on the you know, fifth intercostal space going a little more lateral on that anterior axillary line. Uh, you can see here that there, the diaphragm comes up, again, approximately to the level of the uh, inferior pectoralis uh, fold uh, or the nipple line. And, uh, you know, going in laterally will keep you away from the heart. Um, the uh, advantage to doing laterally over anteriorly is really a body habitus question. Sometimes people accumulate more mass on one than the other. Um, it was felt by the uh, Committee on Trauma that we uh, can more consistently place the, uh, or successfully place the fifth intercostal space uh, catheters. Uh, and it lines up with our teaching for the um, placement of chest tubes. Uh, but either side is okay, um, provided you know, it's placed correctly. Again, if you go too low on the chest uh, down here, then you're gonna risk getting into the liver, getting into the spleen. And not only does it poke a hole in those organs, which uh, can be a variable severity, either not really a big deal or, you know, a, a chronic problem that takes a long time to, to get better. But uh, perhaps more significantly, if you do have a tension pneumothorax and you needle decompress into the liver, you're not going to decompress the pneumothorax. Um, and so, that, you know, you, you may fail to achieve the effect that you wanted for, you know, a, a very time sensitive, life threatening condition. Uh, this is a diagram of somebody putting it in the right place uh, on the lateral side. You see how high he is on the chest wall. Uh, you really want to get under the pectoralis muscle, under the breast tissue, uh, so you're not going through all that thick stuff, uh, but right under that. And you, you should be able to feel the rib and then just go right on top of the rib uh, and insert it like you would an IV. Um, you know, once you get a little bit of air back, you can thread the catheter in um, and take the needle out. The, the risk, as we talked about, are, you know, either you injure an organ you didn't want to, um, including if on the left side, the heart, remember, can be over there, especially in somebody that's uh, got CHF or, you know, one of our uh, more uh, sick trauma patients um, chronically. And, uh, you know, if you're too medial, you're, you're pushing over um, or too high, you know, you can get into the gray vessels, uh, like you can see again on this uh, diagram. Um, the, the less common presentation is something we, you know, often talked about less, seen um, is what's known as the sucking chest wound. And so a sucking chest wound happens when there's a hole in the chest that's about the same size as the trachea, um, can be actually a little bit less, but the, uh, the effect is the pressure it takes to suck air in through the trachea becomes higher than the pressure it takes to suck air in through the chest, but not necessarily to blow it out through the chest or, you know, there may be an internal flap bell. Um, the problem is that as you can see on that lower figure on the right, uh, as the patient breathes uh, in and out, then 
what happens is that the pressure coming in from the the outside air in through the hole uh, in the chest is what builds up and develops the tension in the thorax over time. Um, this is the reason we talk about occlusive dressings on uh, chest injuries. Classically, this is a three-sided dressing, uh, which acts like a flat valve, and so air can blow out, but it seals up as uh, you try to breathe in. Um, I do want to show you this video, which is from the uh, Committee on uh, Combat Casualties. Um, let's see if I can move it over here for you. Because it's, it's a fairly good uh, demonstration of that uh, wound. I can everybody see this one. Can everyone see the video? Yes. Great. What was that? So that is a sternal wound um, that has um, a that sucking chest wound effect. And so that's what it looks like. It has, uh, you know, that, that kind of air comes in and then there's like a flap effect on, on the inside that uh, prevents it from coming out equally and, and uh, being just essentially an open pneumothorax. And that's how pressure can build up on, on the inside. And so putting a, an occlusive dressing on, this is what it looks like. Um, tape on three sides, some saran wrap or garbage bag or glove or whatever over the wound um, and critically leaving a side off, uh, which you can see on that cartoon diagram below is it, it lets air burp out of it, but not easily suck back in. And it doesn't have to be 100%. It just has to sort of change the difference in um, relative difficulty of the air coming in versus going out to uh, keep the problem from accumulating to the point of causing tension. Um, again, it doesn't have to be sterile. You don't have to, to use a tegaderm. It can be whatever, just as long as it's relatively clean. Uh, it's going on the outside of the body. It's gonna get taken off and washed off at some point once they get to the hospital. Um, and so there's fairly low risk of uh, uh, infections and that kind of thing. Um, if you do put a four-sided dressing on, like a, a, a large tegaderm or, a, you know, taping this on all the sides, uh, the risk is it can actually contribute to tension by blocking that hole, which air might be decompressing through, uh, as in the case of an open pneumothorax. So if you have a big old hole in the chest, um, you know, something fairly large, then a lot of times just covering that with a gauze or leaving it alone is, is okay. Um, you know, we have, when we do surgery on the chest, oftentimes there's a large hole in the chest for hours and um, it's fine. The, um, the danger is, is the tension more so than the, the exposed uh, tissue. So most chest injuries don't need surgery, but often need a chest tube. Um, Focus on your ABCs, assessing them. Uh, consider the other injuries that might be there, whether it's you know an internal chest injury, internal abdominal injury, because there is so much overlap between the chest and the abdomen that you know the chest injury can easily be uh, through the stomach, through the intestine, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, also, it's hard. Ask for help. Don't be shy. Don't you know? Assume too many things that you don't know what you don't know. Um, in terms of the abdomen, I, it's a, from a triage standpoint, a little more uh, straightforward, I, I think. From a management of the individual organ injuries, maybe a little more complicated, but um, in terms of deciding what to do in term, is fairly straightforward. So hemorrhage is the problem we worry about the most. Um, and it's the fast problem. It, abdomen hemorrhages are non-compressible. The abdomen is a big floppy balloon. It's uh, big enough to hold enough blood for you to bleed out completely. Um, and so you may not see it, uh, even though they're, they're bleeding substantially. So you, again, in a pre-hospital setting, it's really just getting that person to a, a place to where that bleeding can be controlled um, before they lose too much blood volume and too much of that physiology that, that we started with. Uh, miss, things like missed bowel injuries or spine injury or kidney ureter injuries that are not significantly bleeding but cause 
you know, leaks of material fluids that are infected or uh, dangerous are usually pro are certainly important problems, but slower and, and you know, not necessarily the thing that's going to be the uh, most difficult to repair. Uh, again, showing the same figure from before because the abdomen goes higher and lower than um, is typically thought of. The, it's easy to consider injuries to other parts of the body um, as isolated when in fact they're actually multi-systemic and they go through organs in the abdomen like the liver, the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas. Um, it's very hard to know what the, the trajectory of a penetrating wound is even if you see um, what appears to be an entry and an exit wound. Uh, oftentimes people are moving um, as they're injured. Oftentimes the, the differential uh, densities of the tissues cause tracks in the projectile to be unpredictable, um, even if it comes out at a apparently a clear spot. Um, so the predicting the injury from the pattern or predicting the internal injuries from the external pattern uh, can be uh, very difficult um, and very uncertain. So you have to have a high index of suspicion about the um, um, possibilities of injury more so than excluding them. Uh, this is sort of an example of a fairly uh, or benign case uh, that looked very bad. So it, as you watch this CAT scan coming up, this is the pelvis. You can see some air in the anterior abdominal wall. And then you see a bullet up in the uh, left upper quadrant there. Now as it comes down, watch the bullet. And I'm going to move my mouse cursor here so you can see where the bullet track actually is. And the hole was right there. So the, the bullet track went in the hip on the right side and it came out the side of the chest uh, slash abdomen on the left. Um, apparently had gone through all the inside parts, uh, but in reality, because of those different densities and tissue, it found a plane within the musculature of the abdominal wall and passed through without causing any substantial organ injury. Um, and so this patient was observed overnight and, and went home. Hey, Alistair, can you go through that again and maybe yeah. pause at some of the, you know, just to point out some more of the anatomy? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll let it get up to the top here and we'll watch it come down. There's not really a speed indicator here. All right. So coming down. Liver, stomach. All, okay. like, all that, right? I think the providers would love to know a little more about that. Absolutely. So CAT scans, uh, you know, we looked at one before, but they're a little atypical in terms of reading. Um, they are imaged as if you were looking up through the feet of somebody lying on their back. Um, and so the right side is the left side of the screen. The left side is the right. The front side of the, the body is the top of the screen. And then the back is at the bottom. Um, what you see in this picture is a cut through the upper abdomen, uh, the spine here in the back with the, the bottom of the rib cage coming out the right and the left. Um, you can see again, this is at that lower part of the quote unquote chest where the ribs are still present, uh, but the abdominal organs are, are housed within that section. Um, you see the liver here on the right side, this is a very large structure here. Um, the spleen is this little rim of lighter tissue on uh, the, the body left. Um, and then this is a, a stomach full of uh, cheeseburgers, probably. Um, typical uh, trauma diet. This is the bullet, which is this very bright object. It's very dense because of the, the metal in the bullet. Um, now, as we come down, let's see if I can, oops. So bullet again here, uh, as we come down the body, watch across the anterior abdomen where these muscles are, uh, and you'll see little dots of the dark uh, spots that are air. I'll try to follow that for you here. Um, you can see here, tracking through the, the musculature, there's some that's dissected a little bit laterally. There's a little more there. See so coming out of the muscles finally into the soft tissue. Uh, here you're starting to see the pelvis. This is the you know the, the iliac crest on both sides. 
This is bow. These are the psoas muscles. These are the iliac vessels on the inside. Um, and then again, air tracking here laterally down to the right side and almost. And then you can see a clear bullet track coming up of the hip there. And you can see the skin break in one of the cuts here. So here you're starting to see the break in the skin uh, from the bullet as we're, we're coming around. There it is, uh, right there. Is that helpful, Sean? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Here's a question. Yeah. Um, would love to bring up the application of transexemic acid in bleeding trauma. I used to work in New Jersey where we did have it in our protocol. It is cheap, easy to use in the pre-hospital setting along with having uses in other areas. Why do we not use it in the pre-hospital environment in Maryland? Do you use it at Hopkins? Uh, I've not been part of the pre-hospital policy discussions there. I, uh, you know, I came from Ohio before this where we do, do pre-hospital TXA. Um, Anecdotally, I've, I've had a lot of very good experience with it in those settings, um, but uh, I can't uh, intelligently comment on why Maryland's policy is different. Um, we do use it in Hawkins uh, in the trauma setting, uh, either giving a dose in the emergency department occasionally or, or in the operating room. Um, it does, again, seem to help. We often titrate our uh, coagulopathy, you know, blood clotting problems with the, the TEG test. Uh, which is gives us a graph of how the blood is clotting and can be a very helpful thing to decide whether TXA is helpful or do they need blood products um, of uh, various sorts. And then Patricia Martin, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? I think that's it for now. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to put this particular uh, image up as just a demonstration of um, something that looks bad, but uh, in reality was a fairly minor injury. Uh, what happened here is there's a, a gunshot from across the abdomen that uh, was at just the right speed to drag a piece of bowel out with it. Um, you can see the, the hole in the intestine there where the, the bullet went through. And this is actually all coming through a very small, you know, approximately one inch size defect in the abdominal wall, which stretched out with the energy of the bullet um, and then uh, collapsed down around the segment. Uh, fortunately, this gentleman had no other injuries other than this uh, loop of bowel that was out and repair was a fairly straightforward problem. He was never in shock um, and uh, went home after a couple of days in the hospital. Um, but again, you, the more important thing was when you see this, you don't necessarily know if, if this is the, the only thing injured and it's fairly mild as it was, or, you know, did this also hit the, the root of the mesenteric artery, uh, you know, the portal vein, the spleen, any other large blood filled structure that could be caught, you know, causing him to rapidly bleed out on the inside um, associated with it. Here's another like, fairly large wound. Um, in a patient that uh, presented fairly stable. Uh, again, looks horrible um, and obviously requires some, some work to repair, but uh, his organs were actually relatively intact. It was mostly just muscle uh, that was cut here. Um, what was the mechanism of that injury? I think this was a machete, but I'm not sure. Mm, looks like a machete. Yeah. Um, we actually had a, we had a sword injury not too long ago. Um, that uh, gave us a little bit of issues, too. That's how you stay six feet apart. Yeah. Um, so stopping bleeding in the abdomen, again, it, it's a matter of how you apply pressure. And so the first thing we do typically is uh, make a big cut on the belly and put a lot of uh, cotton sponges in and just pack it down. Um, and this allows uh, the that bleeding to be temporarily stopped while some of that physiology can be recovered either with, you know, medication, electrolytes, fluid, transfusions. Um, the other things we think about are the big blood vessels, the aorta, the uh, inferior vena cava, uh, that 
oftentimes while they bleed a lot and can be very challenging to get to and repair, you can control with just putting your hand on it. Um, the uh, organs obviously are an issue and then mobilizing that is taking some of the tissues down to, to get to those important structures. Uh, while it allows you better access, takes time, and, and usually during that time that the bleeding is ongoing because you're not able to compress and mobilize at the same time. Um, all of this sort of contributes to that. What happens after you get out of the trauma, but you know, you're, you're at the hospital, you get out of the trauma bay, and you're moving towards definitive management, but then there's still that extra work that needs to be done in the operating room, um, and sometimes, you know, quite a lot of it. Uh, in case of multiply injured people to sufficiently control the bleeding for you know a, a in definitive sort of period of time uh, you know we talked about like a possible injury to the mesentery that the mesentery is really just the connection between the inside of the body and the intestine and that's where all the blood vessels go and, and you know the intestine is a very large long loopy structure uh, uses a lot of blood flow because it is responsible for digestion um, and taking all those nutrients back to the body. But if, if there's an injury to those blood vessels, you know, that, that can bleed quite severely. Um, and the, you get to the figure here indicating one way that you can at least uh, temporarily control that, uh, though fixing this is uh, a little more complicated. Uh, sometimes in the case of things like a liver or kidney or spleen, solid organs, um, holding some pressure on it uh, with, uh, help from you know the the other structures in the body can uh buy you some time as well uh, in this case it's demonstrating a liver that's being compressed between two cotton sponges using the diaphragm and the chest wall um, to provide support um, you can see this is a person doing it with their hands or um, on the uh, right side of the screen this is the aorta where it comes down into the abdomen um, in those large vessels that feed the liver the spleen the kidneys uh, the intestine that are being blocked off with a little metal bar. Um, again, just to control a potentially large bleeding hole in the side of the aorta. Uh, again, another picture of how to hold the liver. Um, the liver bleeds a lot, but it is a relatively low pressure bleeding system. And so most of the time, even very severe injuries, once you get inside the abdomen, you can just hold pressure on it and at least buy yourself some time. Um, for gunshot or penetrating wounds, one of the things that you can also do is inflate a, in this case, this is a Penrose drain um, or other balloon type catheter, a, a blank more tube, um, you know, that we used to use a lot for GI bleeding also works pretty well. Um, and then uh, it basically holds pressure on the inside of a large hole um, that, you know, would be very difficult to get in and place uh, sutures. Sometimes the answer is not so much, um, going directly to the organ but bringing the organ to you and especially for things like the the kidney and the pancreas or sorry the kidney and the spleen uh, sometimes the pancreas so you can see here is basically a maneuver that uh, takes the spleen and pulls it out of where it lives and up in the left side of the abdomen uh, typically very high and in the back it can be hard to see hard to get to uh, but it is in many people very mobile and you can actually just pull it up to the midline and, and a, even a bad bleeding spleen can be compressed uh, with your hand to stop it from bleeding and then facilitate taking it out. Um, this is a patient that had a gunshot wound through the pancreas and the spleen. Uh, what you're looking at here is the resected pancreas. Um, the um, cut edge being here on the medial side. Uh, and, and similarly to the last picture, the way that we got control of this was we actually got behind the spleen and lifted everything up and held onto it while we did our pancreas resection, uh, which can take you know some amount of time to actually get it out because it's so far deep into the tissues of the body. Um, similar with the kidneys, uh, getting back, holding pressure on it, lifting it up. All of it takes a little bit of time and, and there is almost always some additional bleeding that happens during that time of control, um, even though we try to limit that obviously as uh, much as we can. The uh, the goal is once we get that bleeding stopped and get the, the patient to a stable place to actually just get out of the operating room. And this is what's called the damage control strategy. We try to, to stop the processes that are ongoing um, and damaging that physiologic reserve um, and get to a place where the patient can recover that. And typically that's the intensive care unit. Um, 
one way that we can do that is we save time by not uh, performing reconstructive techniques at the time of injury uh, in patients that are critically injured um, and even doing things like not closing the abdominal tissues. And so we'll, we'll do things like put a, uh, you know, slippery membrane of plastic over the intestines to keep them protected um, and then putting a uh, suction dressing on top of that, uh, which holds everything in and allows for expansion and swelling as the, the patient continues to get blood transfusions and fluid uh, and prevents them from being harmed as much by that. Uh, takeaways from all this, uh, chest and abdomen injuries can hide how severe they are. It's very difficult to tell from the outside what's hurt on the inside, uh, even with things like uh, x-rays and ultrasounds, um, though they can certainly give you clues. Uh, CAT scans are great for patients that are stable, but in patients that are not, then you, that's often not an option. Um, or in the pre-hospital setting where you don't have these imaging modalities, those are often not an option. Um, so being aware of what these worst cases are and that you know there may be more time sensitive severe problems than uh, what is apparent even in somebody that's like talking awake appears to be um, healthy um, you know that can be a temporary state that's fed by that patient being healthy and having a lot of physiologic reserve but then they're, they're burning that supply as they uh, uh, continue to sit there um, there's a whole lot of bad problems that require complicated uh, surgical approaches. The pancreas one, for example, is uh, one we see sometimes that uh, takes a little bit more, uh, uh, say, operative technique to manage than uh, something like an isolated spleen injury. Um, but uh, it's not something that's necessarily going to uh, be lethal in the same setting as like a tension in the thorax or in the same time time setting uh, or uh, time frame is attention in the thorax. Uh, transport time is really, you know, in the pre-hospital setting, the, the major uh, determinant of mortality. Um, the faster that somebody that is critically injured gets to that point, not necessarily to the hospital, but to that point of definitive control, um, the, the better their chances uh, across the boards. And, um, you know, keeping in mind that once they get to the hospital, there's the, that whole, you know, 20 minutes of triage that happens, and then they can subsequently move to a definitive care phase, uh, which again takes another between, you know, 30 minutes and two hours. Uh, and, and the closer we are to that one hour time frame at the end of all of that process, um, the better, the more likely that people will get out of the hospital and not have a lot of chronic problems and survive. Um, the things that can kill you fast so from a chest and abdomen standpoint always almost always do better with a, a liter or two of uh, isotonic crystalloid. Uh, so that's, you know, like tetrabrinous plasmolite, uh, normal saline if you don't have anything else. And uh, that really, the, the primary purpose of that is to preserve right-sided cardiac function. And, and that's, you know, it, it provides some resistance to increases in pressure that, that would prevent blood flow in the case of a tamponade or a tension in the thorax. Or in the case of bleeding, it gives you some volume to pump. Again, you don't want to over resuscitate uh, because that obviously has problems as well. Uh, but uh, you know, a liter of fluid is not going to do that. Um, there's a handful of things that you can do uh, in those circumstances, and knowing what those are and knowing what your toolbox is um, can help you make those decisions a lot more effectively um, and quickly. And you know, these settings where time matters so much. Um, so, you know, IV access, airways, vasopressors, if you have them, and uh, even needle decompression, as we talked about, can be, you know, life-saving critical interventions for somebody with a time-sensitive problem. Um, I do want to stop there. I know we're, we're kind of running a bit over time here and uh, give you guys some opportunity to discuss and ask some questions. Um, but uh, thanks again for uh, having me, listening and to me ramble. and. All that. That's great, Alistair. Thanks. Hey, you guys, don't forget to sign in. Ashley um, put a link out in the chat function. I'll keep an eye out for that. Click on the link and sign in. It takes only a couple of seconds. Uh, there's a question. Can you please share your thoughts on stabilizing a flail chest segment? How yeah. often do you actually see these? Do you need intervention? If so, how successful is it usually? What works best? Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, in terms of stabilizing a flail chest, I, I don't routinely recommend it uh, in the pre-hospital setting. I, you know, we see a lot of that practice done, um, either with an IV bag or tape or something like that. Um, 
I think the the majority of the time the actual flail is not so much the problem um, that the patient or is going to suffer from as the underlying lung injury. Um, there's a chance that that putting too much pressure on those dressings can cause that lung to be further injured uh, from those rib segments that are kind of poking in. Um, though I, you know, I don't know that there's any data on that. Um, in terms of st fixating those segments, you know, one thing that we do in some cases is actually do surgical plating of the ribs. Um, you typically the time frame for that is about you know 12 to 48 hours after the injury, um, mostly to determine whether the injury is something that is um, able to be managed just with pain control and will heal on its own, or if it's you know to get imaging like a, a 3D reconstructed CAT scan to see it, is the segment so massively disrupted from the um, uh, other rib segments that it's going to cause like chronic problems and needs to be plated. It, potentially contrary to what is intuitive is that most of the ribs are actually encapsulated in several layers of fairly tough tissue and even very severe looking breaks um, often will heal um, on their own with just normal breathing and respiratory support, you know, deep breaths, coughing, that kind of thing. The, the, the critical factor is often pain control. Um, and uh, it's very rare to see a flail chest so bad that the, the actual flail causes mechanical respiratory failure, although we do see it maybe a couple times a year or something like that. And then for pain control, we do a lot of epidural analgesia, right? Trying to Absolutely. really try to get some control because it can be quite debilitating. It can really hinders people's ability to participate in pulmonary toilet, cough, deep breathe, um, and then they get pneumonias. And yeah, so pain control is really important. What other questions do you guys have? Uh, one thing I, I feel like I'm reading a lot more about is trying to limit the amount of fluid trauma patients are getting more permissive mm -hmm. hypotension. Can you comment on that? Sure. So I think the, uh, you know, there's always the old adage of back in my day when I trained is, you know, we thought 20 liters of crystalloid fluid was a great resuscitation and the best way to treat a trauma or a surgical patient. Um, and it turned out that doing that actually caused a lot of other problems in, in terms of respiratory failure, in terms of ARDS, uh, severe lung problems, um, and even things like abdominal compartment syndrome, which, um, you know, where the pressure from all that extra fluid builds up in the abdomen can actually cause a effect just like you would see in a crushed leg injury or something like that where there's cut off of the venous return flow and it can uh, injure the bowel and the other abdominal organs. Um, additionally, like extra saline resuscitation uh, can cause clotting problems because it dilutes out a lot of the factors that um, uh, exist in the blood. And while it provides volume, you know, the difference between a blood pressure of 90 and 120 in a, a typical trauma patient probably does not uh, impact their overall perfusion or their blood flow uh, significantly. Uh, we commonly use the sort of analogy of uh, you don't want to pop the clot, so to speak. And so uh, as uh, Dr. Bernholtz is referring to this hypotensive resuscitation um, is meant to guide you to give uh, enough support without overdoing it and causing the other problems that uh, can happen on the back end. Um, and typically those are being cold, being coagulopathic, uh, being acidotic in the case of normal saline, uh, depleting your other clotting factors. Uh, the best thing we can do for somebody that is hypotensive and bleeding is stop the bleeding. The second best thing is to give them blood um, if they remain hypotensive. Uh, the uh, crystalloids and things like that are, are great because they can store effectively and we can keep them for a long period of time and they're cheap, but uh, our not without their problems in terms of um, supporting somebody's physiologic state through a, a significant injury. You could say the same thing about certain blood products as well, but that's really the... Do you know if the trauma guidelines, the target map still 65 or is it 55 or is that... We usually say systolic of 90, um, but that, you know, I think that's the, the, 
the idea is that you don't overdo it. It's not so much about the individual number. I mean, if you're at night, especially if you have some sort of mental status to help guide you or, uh, you know, end organ perfusion guide that uh, you can follow, whether that's capillary refill in the skin or uh, urine or that kind of thing. You, you have to be a little bit careful with things like uh, spine injuries when you can have distributive shock. Um, as a result of loss of neurovascular tone. Uh, but if you're measuring blood pressures, you should be able to stay ahead of that. Um, the key is like, you know, if you've got a blood pressure of 90 or 100, don't think you still have to give them a whole bunch of extra fluid. Or, you know, if you just spiked another bag of uh, saline or whatever, you know, you can, you can slow it down to a drip, slow drip or maintenance rate or even shut it off. Um, and that's okay. You know, you don't need to just give more to give more. Uh, which again, all the fluid you put in has to come out at some point. All the fluid you put in is going to dilute things. It's going to, you know, change the pH. It's going to change their electrolytes. And uh, especially if we're going to need to do a lot more resuscitation once they get to the hospital, you know, you don't want to burn all your bridges ahead of time. There are no other questions in the chat right now. Okay. Right, Alistair, thank you. Thank you for sharing your time, your expertise, all those great pictures. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen at 32 raised her hand. Yeah, pretty good. Let me see if I can get her unmuted. Yeah, it's not letting me unmute. Am I unmute it now? You are. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you, Dr. Kent. It was, it was great uh, information and training. Um, I'm actually just going to embarrass Dr. Barinholtz. Um, I appreciate that. Sorry. I, um, I want to thank him and Ashley for all the training that you guys do all the time and still keeping it up during COVID. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the president of the Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, where Sean and Ashley are members. And I just wanted to say how proud I am that Dr. Barinholtz won um, through the Maryland State Firemen's Association, the Josias Hunt EMS Person of the Year for 2020 this year. Um, unfortunately, the convention was canceled, so he hasn't gotten his award in person yet, but I just want to thank him for all he does. Not only does he have a family and he's a busy doctor and firehouse and covering the medic and a um, member of our board of directors. Um, he does all these trainings. So thank you, Dr. Barinholtz. Thank you, Ashley, and everyone who comes on 50 some people tonight. So that's all I wanted to say. Sorry to embarrass you. Kathleen, thanks. Thanks as always for your support. You've always been a big supporter of this program and yeah, your own dedication to the volunteer system. You know, I think it's so interesting, right? So many of us who are in medicine right now, including Kathleen, who is a nurse at GBMC, a very senior nurse at GBMC. Um, so many of us got our start in the volunteer system. So it's, a, it's a really quite a privilege and an honor to be able to support uh, this community. And, and Alistair, as always, for your support of this community, I know you've given talks in the past. We have a whole list of other talks that you've um, a list of uh, topics that you've given me that I'll continue to plug into our agenda uh, and our schedule moving forward. Thanks, so thank you so much. Congratulations again. Thanks. I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Be well. Stay safe. Please wear your masks. Wear your mask. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right, good night. Good night.